when I think about what we make, uh, it's really about the talent pipeline of, for tomorrow, thinking about preparing students so that they can be successful with um, the world of work that awaits them. A quick interruption to mind you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari Santiago. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Made in America podcast. Today, I'm with Shannon Merimon, who is the executive director of Ready CT, early stage workforce development arm of CBIA. Shannon, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you, Ari. Listen, it's really great having you on. It's Made in America podcast. So we start off with the same two questions, Shannon. What do you make and why do you make it? So I thought a lot about that coming onto the show. Um, I, when I think about what we make, uh, it's really about the talent pipeline of, for tomorrow, thinking about preparing students so that they can be successful with um, the world of work that awaits them. That's awesome. We definitely need to get into that. Mm -hmm. But always really important to me is the why. You yes. know, that's what you do. But why do you do it? Because we still have a lot of work to do to be better at that. Um, I think we are, we're, we're getting there. There's been a real shift even in the last five years to better align our educational systems with our workforce needs. Um, and I think that our affiliation with CBIA and with other stakeholders has allowed us to really start to move that needle and change the, the conversation and the narrative. Um, so there's a lot of work still to be, do, be done, but that's why we do it. And you have to get up every single day and think about, you know, as the leader of this organization, moving it forward, you got to think about getting in there. What does the fire for you come from? Like, what makes it important to you, Shannon, to get this done? Um, I think, you know, sitting at the intersection of education and business is something that I, I didn't necessarily know that's where I would end up. Um, but it makes a lot of sense when I look back at where I came from and the experiences that I had with exposure to um, family members and professions, uh, all members of my family either sit squarely on um, kind of the industry trade side or the education side. And this role is kind of squarely in the middle of that. Um, and it, so it's kind of, it just sort of made sense. Like I, maybe it was just an accident, but it, but it really worked out. And I just, that's what gets me up every morning is that I found a spot that, you know, it's not, it's not a job I even knew would have would exist, which is the point of the work we do, is to expose students to things they didn't even know were out there. Um, but then having found my way to this position, it, it just feels right. So let's do, I'm gonna, I want to circle back to that, but I also want to kind of help people understand what Ready CT is mm -hmm. for, for those that don't know. So a lot of folks uh, who listen to the podcast are familiar with the programs that we have at community colleges. Mm -hmm. They may be familiar with the trade schools. They also may be familiar with some of the workforce development, sort of, you know, the upskilling, the incumbent mm -hmm. workforce training, the different stuff we've been able to get for funding through the MIF, through some of the trade groups. But I'm not sure everyone really understands Ready CT sure. and where Ready CT kind of fits into the workforce development picture. And related to that, why they should care. Right. Um, so maybe, maybe you could help sort of set the stage of in the constellation of workforce development, where does Ready CT fit? Sure. So um, we our roots were more in the area of policy advocacy work. We we started as a, under a different name ten years ago, um, really with the thought that policy was the theory of change. That's the way to transform the educational system and get it to kind of the next phase of of what it can be and how it can best prepare students. Um, along the way, we went through. Some, some changes. I think recognizing that policy has its limitations. And when you um, say policy, should I, can I translate that to people in the audience to say um, leg lobbying? Yeah, like legislative. legislative lobbying. Yep. Essentially, policy yep. is saying we are going to work with the people at the state house and hopefully maybe even some of the towns to get them to change. Exactly. And okay. and a syst kind of a systems level approach. If we don't tackle this at a at scale through legislation, then it, we're just going to be tinkering at the edges. With the underlying concept that there's something core off with yes. the Okay. Yes. So at the time, the reason that we were formed in the first place was that Connecticut had the largest achievement gap in the country, which is the disparity between um, students of low socioeconomic need, need means, which also typically correlates with um, students of color, 
and their counterparts. So that gap, that divide between academic achievement is was just so pronounced that we couldn't we couldn't not pay attention to it. Um, so there was a, an effort to study that deeply, and then our organization was born with a roadmap of kind of recommendations that they had developed to um, change policy in order to close those achievement gaps. Um, they they made it. They made it to a certain point. You know, there was a lot of work done with the Malloy administration. There was an education reform bill of 2012 that put into effect a number of of pretty um, universal changes. Some played out well. Some didn't didn't move the needle at all. Um, and so I think along the way, the organization recognized that policy can only take you so far if you don't support the implementation, because there are a lot of laws on the books in Connecticut that just aren't they're either ignored or they're done kind of people go through the motions to meet the letter of the law, but it doesn't really accomplish the the, the change in behavior or the change in outcomes that we want to see. So from like a business perspective, the way I sort of connect that is saying ideas are great. Yes. But ideas are meaningless if we don't execute. Yes. And so if all we're doing is talking to leaders with ideas, even if they buy into the ideas, but those ideas never get implemented, what good did we actually do? Exactly. So we decide? So we, um, in 2012, there was the effort to partner with CBIA more, more directly. Um, I think the thought of this organization had always been that it started coming from a place of the moral imperative. You know, we cannot stand for having all of these students being left behind. And and it was a growing number of our student population, um, our, our, you know, in, especially our, in our urban centers and in our rural environments. The, the, the population of students that are being most impacted by that achievement gap is just growing. And so um, we had to address it from a moral imperative, but at the same time, it was also an economic imperative. And there had always been a strong representation on our board of directors from the business community. So in 2017, there, it just made sense, I think, as a natural pairing to partner up with CBIA. Um, we've, over the last four years, really clarified what that relationship means, but it's moved us more into the realm of direct programming and support for schools and districts because we need to be able to build their capacity in order to implement the legislation. It's an, And we want to make sure that the practice on the ground and the, out, the practice that yields results is then um, informing policy. Uh, you know, you can't go up to the Capitol and testify. I mean, you can, but you, you shouldn't probably go up to the Capitol and testify if you don't have any sense of what is actually happening on the ground and what how a new proposal is going to really affect the people it's intended to support. I mean, there are a lot of unintended consequences, I think, in legislation, you know, well-intentioned, but then they didn't do their due diligence to understand how that new law would actually play out. Um, so, so I think we're in a really uh, nice place now where we've balanced our portfolio of work so that it's it's equal parts um, direct programming and supports. Actually, I'd say it's that skews higher. And then we are always using that to inform the policy work that we do. I think that's so important. And again, to connect it back to business, I think, you know, when we have an idea in business and it could be for a new product, could be for improving a particular process, that if all we do is go into a boardroom, which I'll call the policy area, and think about how to do it, and we pontificate about it, and we put it on a whiteboard, even with the best of intentions, but we don't get out to the floor, you know, what some people call getting into the Gemba and really understanding what's happening and seeing how those decisions and their implementation is either good or bad and taking that feedback loop to reinform decisions exactly. and create that, that yep. what I'll call that virtuous cycle we just have major disconnects. And then what happens is there's frustration. The policy people don't understand why the changes aren't happening. And the people at the ground level are wondering why the policy people don't make better policy. And I feel like I've heard that before on the uh, yeah. education front. Yep. So. yep. It's a common theme. Yeah, um, yeah. And and the interesting thing was that when all of this legislation, especially in 2012, which did incorporate a, a huge number of recommendations from the organization I now represent. <laughs> um, I was on the other side. I was at, at the State Department of Education um, working for uh, the talent office, and I had to implement a lot of that legislation and realize the downfall <laughs> of the way in which some of the the language was, what, what language was chosen, um, just, it, you know, imprecise language that then made things more co confusing, and then you had to interpret 
what we thought the legislation was supposed to do. Um, we got down to the point where we were, there was legislation where in one place it said in collaboration with, and in another place it said in coordination with, and we had a legal battle over which one meant, what did each one of those mean and which one trumped the other. I was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so, so I think that that is where I come from going into this work is that I recognize the limitations of policy. I also recognize the power of policy. Um, but it has to be informed. It has to be really well thought out. And the, and wording words matter. Like you have to think really carefully about how you wordsmith the legislation. Yeah, and also probably some feedback loop, right? About Because yes. there's just, I mean, listen, I don't care how much, I, I, it seems to me almost impossible, no matter how much effort you put in to get a piece of policy together, that's going to be right from day one, right. right? Because it just, when it hits the ground, the, either the things on the ground, they often change the number of students, the background of students, the jobs we're trying to prepare them for. Those are changing. So we need, it seems like we would need that feedback loop right. and ready CTs in that position. Yeah. And I think we're trying to keep it um, agile and um, kind of like you're saying in the business world, it's got to be about like that rapid results approach where you're kind of uh, applying and trying something out and then immediately adjusting based on what you see happening. Um, it's hard to do that sometimes with legislation because if you codify it, it's really hard to undo. Um, so I think we're, we're pulling back from jump, you know, I think people get a little uh, trigger happy with policy. Like I just want to put out that bill and get my name on it and get that credit um, without thinking through whether it's really necessary. Does it actually hamstring us further? Um, so I think we're always trying to be uh, kind of the, the person in the room bringing that sound judgment to the conversation and and it's some history. I think there's been a lot of turnover in the policy world. So you have people who are like, I have a great idea. And it's like, well, we actually tried that 10 years ago. <laughs> so you kind of want to, you know, not to burst someone's bubble, but to say like, you need to know what's come before, before you, you've set out. Um, and so I think we're always, always thinking about the, the power and the, the, kind of shortcomings of policy. And then more than anything, like I said, switching more to the direct programming to show the the art of the possible. Like what can we actually be doing on the ground that maybe pushes the boundaries of um, how we think about preparing students for So what does that look like? Work? So you know you've been sort of you said it sort of changed the focus in the last four years with CBIA. What is that what does that look like? Talk about that a little sure. bit. Sure. So we have kind of four four buckets of work. Our first is career pathways support. Mm -hmm. So we're directly an intermediary with schools and school systems with supporting a career pathway experience for a student. Usually it's a 9th through 12th grade uh, experience. And, and we do predominantly work with um, K through 12, um, but we'll also try to break the, the um, boundaries into higher ed as well because those transition points should be seamless and and the silos are somewhat artificial that we've made so we but we we work with the career pathway program very much focused on grades 9 through 12 starting even though earlier in middle school to recruit students into the pathway um and those programs run that run the gamut. Um, they're they're career themed. Um, one that's most specific to manufacturing is our engineering and green technology pathway at Hartford Public High School. Um, we it's it's kind of got three three components to it. One is an integrated curriculum that's informed by business um, members. So we have the curriculum reviewed, what what the teachers are going to teach the students. We have industry leaders look at it and say this is relevant. This is uh, you know, something useful for when the students come into the work workplace versus this is something that's outdated. The second component is an industry advisory board that is based at the school, kind of adopts the school and feels this real need to champion the school, which is kind of awesome. Um, and that's representative of, of business leaders from typically that theme. So engineering green technology theme. So we have representatives across the board there. And then the third component is work-based learning. So making sure that the students have a continuum of experiences with starting with exposure to different opportunities all the way to applied learning where they're actually taking the learning from their classroom and applying it to the world of work. Um, and most of the, the, our programs culminate in a paid internship experience. So it's 120 hours of paid work time um, that is very much guided and supported throughout the, the process. So that's Career Pathways is kind of this whole collection of things that we do. We've complemented it even further with something called educator externships, where we get educators out into the world of work, mm -hmm. um, realizing that we need not only the buy-in of the students and their families, but also the educators. You know, they can be a, they can be a, a kind of a, 
unintended barrier if they don't know Mm -hmm. that this isn't even an offering um, at their own school. Uh, So we're bringing them along for the ride. Um, And we're also partnering a lot with higher ed. Like I mentioned, we're trying to bring the opportunities that exist up in higher ed into the high schools even sooner. So we have great partnerships with Goodwin University, with their eCamp program, which is an advanced manufacturing program. Um, We have uh, 30 students currently enrolled in that. Um, and we work with his Nuntuck and Tunxis Community College. So we're definitely making those, helping make those transitions for students who, like they don't, the week, again, adults usually create more problems than, <laughs> than they need. Um, there, it, it should just be a very clear, seamless pathway for, for the student. Um, but it's not. But it's not. I mean, well, I think, well, you, you had referenced earlier, you said we sort of create these artificial silos and I was waiting for a time to pop in to ask you, like, talk about, I, I just, silo. Very, well, <laughs> like, I mean, I know what a silo so is, but, silos. It, but, uh, but yeah, I don't, I just, I'm just like really curious what that, can you dig into that reference? Um, I mean, I think that we just have, you know, separate governance. It's a governance structure piece where we think about the governance for the, the, the K-12 system is the Connecticut State Department of Education and the State Board of Ed. And then you have a lot of local and regional boards of ed that do their own local policies and, and procedures. Um, and then the, there's a separate office of higher ed that mm-hmm. deals with the post-secondary, the higher higher education space, but only the private institutions. And then you have the CSCU system, which is the Connecticut State Colleges and University System and the Board of Regents, and they support just the state colleges, the, you know, the community college system and the four state universities. And then UConn is its own whole separate thing. And it's just like, this doesn't make any sense. And so pers- I think on the backside, we do fall down on some of the um, the lack of coordination and connections because those are separate governance governing bodies around that those areas of work. For, and from a student perspective, they don't care. <laughs> they they really don't care. They just want to know where you know this is my aspiration. This is where I want to get some exposure to something. Where do I go next? And to make that as streamlined and accessible to them as possible is something. So where are the roadblocks there? I guess I'm I'm just trying to connect with like kind of walk me through maybe an experience like where does that where does that pose a problem or where does that create create a roadblock having those different governance structures so i think just um knowing who to talk to like even the 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 school counselors you know that that's in and of its own itself its own roadblock is that we have these very unsustainable ratios of school counselors to stu- to students so in some of our schools it's 450 students per one counselor yeah. um and then that individual is expected to know about the college process you know college going process and then the different college options that are out there and for that person it's really hard there's no one stop shop for that person to find out about the different offerings and opportunities and then there's the whole world of work which is what we really want school counselors to start talking to students about starting you know in in elementary school quite frankly but they don't have the the capacity to or the bandwidth to also learn about all the different career opportunities that are out there so we have to think about way, ways um to make that information again kind of like a one stop shop centralized um source of information and then also i think um uh, build build systems for students to just pl- you know plug into w- everything that's out there. I, I I think it's just a there's just a lot of moving pieces more than anything. I wouldn't say that there's anything intentionally trying to be a barrier. It's just a it's just too many moving pieces that aren't well coordinated. Yeah, a lot of lot, too much. A lot of the, a lot of options hard to kind of figure yeah. out what's what. Yeah. So let's go back to the pathways uh, program for a little bit. So where did that concept where did that pathways concept come from? Um, so we actually, we we do work off of a, p- a particular model called NAF. It's the National Academy Foundation, which was founded about 40 years ago by Sandy Weil, the head of um, Citigroup. And the um, model is, it's I always describe it as um, it's not rocket science. It's, <laughs> it's, it's got the three components I talked about, which is the curriculum, the industry advisory board, and the work-based learning. Um, and but I think what it does provide is the discipline around following that model consistently and not compromising any aspect of it because it's really tempting. I think a lot of schools will do something the dabble in career pathway work and they'll kind of have a course or they'll have you know a one-off internship experience that happens for one year and then goes away the next year. Um, the NAF model 
requires you to be very, very committed to it year in and year out and follow all of the elements or fidel- kind of have fidelity of implementation to that model. Um, and then we're accountable to that. We have to submit data to NAF um, and partner with the school district to submit that data uh, and show that we're following all the, the program requirements. Um, so that's where the literally where the framework came from. And then, like I said, we've put our own spin a little bit on it by complementing it with the educator externship component, which is not a NAF. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they, they support that idea, but they don't require it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the dual, en- the dual enrollment or the, the, the um, connection with higher ed where students can start to take coursework at, higher, at the higher ed level and get credit is something that we've really wanted to bake in to the programming. Right, which is that where we got into the breaking down the silos, right? Yes. Just because I'm in high school doesn't mean I can only take courses in exactly. high school type of thing. Especially exactly. when I, so what, I guess let me, let me flip this a different way then. It, why is there, I, I mean, I know this is maybe a weird way to think about it, but why isn't everybody in a career pathway type of a program? I would love to hope that we will get there. <laughs> um, I mean, that is... Uh, on the policy side, on the systems change side, that's the piece we're trying to push on. Um, we are very, um, uh, very connected and aligned with the Governor's Workforce Council effort that's happening under Governor Lamont uh, and Kelly Valerie's office, the Office of Workforce Strategy. We, when you look at our policy platform, it completely aligns with what they're looking to do. Um, and I think the end goal would be that all students have access to uh, career pathway opportunities and ideally even have some sort of a um, expectation that all students will participate in something. Um, you know, some states are as bold as requiring a work-based learning experience for all students. Some states have that already? Mm-hmm. Yep. Like, so, where is that done? Um, so I, I believe it's Maryland. And then I've been speaking with Wisconsin and Michigan about their programs. They're not necessarily compulsory, but they're starting to move it in that direction. Because what percentage of high school students in Connecticut participate in Old Pathway? I am trying to get that figure. Um, <laughs> it's really hard to to pin that down. Um, and it depends on how what you, how you define it. I, again, is it is it a a one and done job shadow visit, do you count that? Or is it only count if it's a more intensive internship experience like what we're requiring of students? So I think we'd have to have a common uh, language around what we say a high quality work-based learning experience should be. Um, There are some parameters around that related to the State Department of Education, and we work really closely with our colleagues there. Um, They have an amazing team of people dedicated to this work. but it's, you know, I don't think that there's been, a, I think the State Department could probably um, be a little more heavy handed when it comes to this, honestly. And it's just hard sometimes for them to. Because otherwise, to do what it. do kids do? Just like float through high school, taking like whatever classes? Like and- more of a general ed path, um, like what you. I mean, most people kind of have have experience, which is, you know, you have general ed requirements. They have changed the high school graduation requirements in the last couple of years. So now there's a little more flexibility. You don't have to do kind of the 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 four math, the three science, three science. It's there's nine credits required in STEM. Um, the challenge is, and this is another silo piece, is that the higher ed institutions haven't quite caught up with admissions requirements in all cases. So they may still require more of the classic course. They want to see the course load and the transcript that mirrors the the old school kind of these are the classes that a student is supposed to take. Whereas we want to get them thinking outside the box and like, no, actually, maybe taking computer science is more important or, or <laughs> is just as important or more important than than chemistry or and, and not to pit subjects against each other, but you just need to give that flexibility. Um, right. So not because one size fits all. It's not the world that we live in these days. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's interesting. What, what's the, what's been the reception from this effort from the education side? And, and what do you hear from the business community? Um, on the education side, I've been really pleased with how the, 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 there is this shift. Um, you know, I, like I said, I started in this working back in Connecticut. I'm originally from Connecticut and moved back here 10 years ago. Um, and when I started working in, in the education space here, this was not a conversation. <laughs> and I'd say in the last five years, it's really ramped up. And I, I think a little bit was because there was such a high unemployment rate 
uh, pre-COVID that there was just this need, desperate need for workforce and for ensuring that students were prepared for or, or that um, employers could find candidates for the positions that they had open. Um, there was also just a general sense that even with those that they were hiring, they were not at a readiness level that they wanted to see from the employer side. So I think the educators are starting to appreciate that and recognize their role in preparing students for the world of work. Um, there's you're kind of getting at the heart of attention in education, which is like, what is the purpose of education? Is it about self-actualization and finding your passion and your love and your interest and wherever that might take you? Or is it more about pragmatic pre preparation and a set of skills that will set you up for success when you go out and look for your first job? And it, it's got to be somewhere in the middle. I mean, we have- I, was like, I don't really understand that there's a tension there. There's a tension in the sense that I think we've we tend to always skew strongly one way or the other. I mean, a oh, lot of things. A lot of so things it's a it, continuum more than a tension. It, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think if you talk to different people, especially like there's the divide plays out when you're looking at some of our higher achieving, more affluent school districts compared with school districts that are struggling and more under resourced. Kind of this, the privilege that some of the more resource districts have to think about coursework offerings and what. What are they preparing students for? They're preparing them to go on to a four-year college, um, get into the best college you can possibly get into. Even if you have no clue what you want to actually do with your life, just just keep going, keep going with the education. Um, which I like, I, you know, I'm a I'm a product of that experience myself, but I I also see that that's flawed in the sense that well, what about all the students who don't want that and they're just oh. kind of following a path that has been prescribed for them. Um, a lot of people will ask me, would you have the same conversations you're having um, in Hartford, in Avon or, or Greenwich? And I'm like, yes, for sure. Because those students are just as, I mean, we are not serving students well across the continuum. So I think just that. Because you're saying it's either, it's what? It's either one way, it's either way too much of this like ethereal, let's just figure out who you are, kumbaya, yep, you'll, you'll yep. get there. And in the meantime, College, maybe a master's, maybe a whatever. Just, just yeah. let's keep going. Get those to degrees. You, all so those you degrees. figure something out, yes. and then, yeah. or on the other hand, it's just like let's get you a job. Yes, and it doesn't. It shouldn't be. It's a. It's a kind of um, false equivalency. Like we've made this polarization that shouldn't be real. Um, and I think that that's what we're trying to land, kind of in that middle sweet spot. And that's through the the conversations we've been having with educators. So to your original question, I think the education community is starting to be very receptive to this. Um, I mean, you've even, you've had Sal Menzo, the superintendent mm -hmm. of Wallingford on your show, and he is a perfect embodiment of an educator who- But seems like an outlier. Yes. In my limited, yes. I don't, listen, I don't want to run in the educational circles, so, but- but it feels like an outlier. From a bit, my yeah. I, but there's more and more kind of moving yeah. in that direction. And I think a lot of, if you talk to a lot of career technical education teachers themselves, I mean, we work a lot with that particular um, subject matter expert in the school systems and those individuals in a lot of cases are career changers, which is also an interesting thing to consider is who, where do we get educator, where do we build the educator pipeline? Mm. And um, those who are career changers oftentimes come with a completely different view of what it is that they're trying to do with education. Um, and they get really excited about getting the kids connected to um, projects that are grounded in the real world and connecting to businesses and their communities. Um, and so they're huge champions of what we're trying to do. So, I mean, you've talked about business, you talked about, edu you know, the, about the education community, but we really haven't talked about parents yet. Yeah. And, you know, you sort of danced around it and alluded to it in our last like, kind of statement about the different communities or what have you. But, you know, listen, I mean, just I'm connecting with this personally because I felt like I was on the, you know, education factory line, you know, um, and it was just like, you know, it was expectation of, you know, high school, get a good GPA, get to the best college you can, determine what advanced degree you're going to get to get into whatever profession. And, you know, a lot of that is mo is certainly supported by the educational establishment in my experience going through West Harvard. But I think it was also a lot because that's what the parents, including my own, demanded. You know, that's what they wanted, right? Yep. So, you know, I mean, the supply and demand is a real thing. And, and it was an interesting 
you know, it's hard to know what worked for me, what didn't work for me. You know, I never made it through um, college because partway through, I was like, I don't want to be a lawyer. This doesn't really work for me, right, you know? Right. Um, and, and, but, you know, so how do we, where do we engage with parents? Because it seems to me so it's going to start there. Or yes. We can't, we're not going to get very far without them on board. Yeah. So we're doing a lot of uh, work in that area. We fully recognize that parents can be, again, an, a barrier and un, even a um, kind of unintentional barrier for their students because, again, you don't know what you don't know. You also, th- we've defined success in very specific ways in our society, and we need to broaden that. We need to blow that up a bit um, and show students and their families what is out there and what's possible. How can you have an incredibly high growth job opportunity um, that's outside of the realm of the kind of the four? I mean, I was just thinking about this this morning that when you go on the the kind of the 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 continued education um, uh, uh, kind of conveyor belt, there's four jobs that you're told exist in the world. It's lawyer, doctor, consultant, or finance person. <laughs> and like in it, finance, like whatever, you, however you pronounce it. Um, and that, I mean, that's what I learned. That's yeah. what I learned through mm-hmm. my college experience. And I was like, but I don't want to do any of those things. And um, I did pre-med and I passed out in the hospital multiple times. Like it just wasn't <laughs> a good fit. And it's good. You know, I did a lot of my own work-based learning experiences to determine what I didn't want to do. Um, but that, just that, but that's why yeah. I'm sorry. I, that, that to me is, I think, a piece that people need to embrace so much more and something that's been so was so successful for me because despite the educational conveyor belt push, I also had tons of support to kind of pursue my like wild, you know, business aspirations. So by the time I dropped out of college, my, my junior year with a reasonably good GPA, it wasn't, it wasn't kicked out or anything, but you know, I had already had five different businesses. I had a cell phone and pager store. I had a, you know, environmental uh, products business. I had two IT businesses and I sort of been encouraged to do those, but on the side, Right. Like, right. you know, like, like a that's side like, hustle. Yeah. yeah, totally. Like, you know, almost yeah. like a hobby. Yeah. Um, but it was those experiences and a, and a couple of like, you know, a, a, a summer a job in high school at, at um, Robinson Nicole Law Firm in Hartford kind of doing some IT stuff. And I did a sales gig for um, a company in New Britain, like just random stuff. But that was sort of my own initiative that was sort of supported. Mm-hmm. And I look back and think to myself, how many people could have been helped by getting out there because you you don't really know what the world of work is exactly. without getting there. Yep. Yep. So so I think it, it's it's all of that. Um, and it's not to negate continued education. I do f- fully believe that any career you're going to go on to is going to require additional education, but it maybe doesn't take the form of what we've always thought of as the right path. Um, I think more and more uh, companies are offering, you know, you, you start working right out of high school and then we'll pay for your mm-hmm. degree later on. Or um, or you can go on and do a, a 13-month cert certificate program at at his Nuntuck and immediately get a position in a very high wage um, uh, option that then propels you Mm -hmm. forward in that company. And so I think seeing that there are these options and that there's a vast, a much vaster array of different industries and functions out there um, that could appeal to, to, I mean, every person is different and that's the beauty of humanity. And I think we need to be tapping more into that when we think about the design of our education. So how does Ready CT make, how does Ready CT kind of activate that vision? I mean, a lot, a lot through our direct programming, we can obviously influence the students we work with most closely. So we're working with, in in the Hartford area, about a thousand students in total um, that we support through the career pathway work. And we can be very hands-on and start to to push on, on just the, the potential for those students and give them those opportunities. We're also looking at ways to grow. I mean, one thing that we've talked a lot about recently is social capital mm-hmm. and this idea that a lot of people, I mean, one thing that continued education certainly provides you is the, your network grows and you have access to people who are going to hook you up later on when you need, uh, you need, you know, kind of a, a foot in the door. Um, to build that social capital for students who, especially in places just wouldn't have it otherwise. Um, a lot of people take that for granted. So we're doing that with the students we can most directly influence. At There's the- also vision too, Shannon. You know, yeah. like I, and this, I, we've, we talked about something, I talked about it with Sal and, and some other folks. Um, actually, I think Joe Brennan had talked about maybe getting involved in like the, in the Hartford Public School, like, mm-hmm. you know, that that deal. And, and we had talked about this as, um, you know, talked about this as well, which is you only 
know what you see. Yes. Yep. And so if you grew up in a in a world where chronic unemployment and the highest aspiration was, you know, uh, a frontline retail job, um, then then that's what you think is possible. If you grow up in a world where every time your parents have people over, they're talking to people who are judges, doctors, lawyers, then that's what you think is right. possible and not anything else other than that. So, so, I mean, it's, it, I just, I, it, to me, this career pathways thing, so exciting from a perspective of giving people an opportunity to see that there are things that are possible they haven't seen before. Yep. yep. And I think related to manufacturing, that's in, particularly important because I, I think that that's an industry area. Yeah. I didn't growing up in Connecticut, I didn't have an awareness and mm-hmm. an appreciation <laughs> Of what we had around us. And I was from a family where people were working in the industry, like kind of more my, you know, my grandfather worked at Colt my, and my uncles worked with Pratt & Whitney and um, at a small local tool, um, tool company. And I should have known that that was such, such a rich and, and having Stanley Black & Decker in our backyard. But I don't think I really fully appreciated that because we're, we're not good at exposing and explaining to students what it is, uh, what, and, 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 you know, you've, you've heard this a lot on, on your show, I'm sure, like the dark, dirty, dangerous perspective that students and parents have about that field. And we need to completely turn that on its head and, um, and celebrate what we, what we do have here in Connecticut and then connect it even more to it too, because I, I think the second bucket, you know, I've talked about career pathways, but our second big bucket of work is computer science education and Connecticut is woefully behind in making sure that all students have access to and participate in computer science coursework in K-12. And that is the future, whatever industry you're talking about. Oh, you're, you're, um, you're, you're singing my song yeah. right now, Shannon. So, yeah. I can't, I've been, I've been on this bus and on this train, whatever, for a long time saying that we got to get on it. And manufacturing is no different because yep. we're looking out there right now and we, we do a lot in technology manufacturing and the amount of data mm-hmm. that's being generated, the amount of connectivity of the devices, the programming of what the machines are doing. I mean, it is the robotics. I mean, it is, yep. if you're not, if you're not on it, you're going to be in it's big, gonna pass you by. big yeah. trouble. Yeah. 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 So, um, so I think that there's, uh, such a great opportunity now to kind of show the nuance or not. It's not even the nuance. It's showing what was right in front of our eyes all along, but bringing a really stark like light to it and celebrating it. Um, and so I think we are doing that with the career pathway work. And then with the computer science work, it's it's even more kind of narrowly defined in some ways. And at the same time, there's so much work still to do there. And, um, and we have a lot kind of we're doing work that's directly supporting districts to expand their computer science programs, but also bringing it up to the policy level again. Listen, no, you know, while you're out there, I'm going to throw in my little two cents here since I got you is, you know, I think computer science should be part of a basic curriculum. Like you yes. were talking about three mass, three English, whatever. I mean, like, let's, let's get some, you know, I mean, we're memorizing stuff I can look up on Google, but we're not teaching anybody Amen. how to think. Yep. I mean, it's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we're kind of running a little bit out of time, but if I got so much more to ask. you want to help us on a, on a policy, on a legislative bill. Uh, I don't know about that, that but I'll help you get the message out. You know, <laughs> like let's, I mean, so that's cause actually where I was going to go is, you know, how do other places get people behind it? I mean, listen, we've all been through the same, you know, roughly the same sort of history in terms of industrialization. How did some areas learn to embrace this? Is it messaging? Is it edu- Is it Educate, not educating the kids, but educating the community. Like what, what's happened in other places to get them to embrace it more than we are? Yeah, I think it starts with communication. I think it starts with getting to parents, getting to boards of education. Um, it's something that we've started to talk. I mean, I know when Chris Dipentima from CBIA was on your show, he talked about like his definition of success is getting in front of the mm-hmm. parent-teacher organization at a school district and explaining to them why the kind of the economic vitality of our state matters to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think convincing local and like working with Chris and getting out that message is going to be really key which will start to push this conversation even further. I do think it's also on the, leg- to some extent, the policy with a capital P, but then also policy with a lowercase p, which is just sort of these self-imposed policies that people think are on the books or are required. But when you actually look at them closer, you're like, actually, that we have a lot more wiggle room there than we thought. <laughs> um giving permission, like permissiveness to educators in particular to approach the way they did they deliver education differently um i mean it's we were 
again, pre-COVID, I think starting to see some real exciting things happen. Um, and then COVID sort of required a whole different shift of, of focus and education. And now I worry that a lot of educators can't like... M- can't even step back enough at this point to look at the the mental model of what could be possible because they're so in the throes of what's happening right now. But there are others who can. I think there are groups like our organization, a lot of other stakeholders, the business community, the Governor's Workforce Council, who are saying like, what, like, what, how should we come out the other side on this and have there be a transformation and give permission to educators and educational systems to start to move that way. And so I think other states do that to different and varying degrees, maybe less less legislation and less regulation will ultimately be what what helps us out. So I think we're, we're, we're getting there. Well, listen, Shannon, don't let a good crisis go to waste because exactly. we've got exactly. this, uh, you know, this is really opening up people's eyes to making changes. And I think to your point on the education piece, as the as it looks like probably in the fall, hopefully, we'll be kind of coming back to a different type of schooling that won't rely so much on um, being remote. Yes. And I think on that revert back, there's going to be a big opportunity to make some impact. Are you ready? Yeah. No, I, we, we actually are meeting actually with legislators to look at an, a bill around um, – doing a further study and understanding of what just happened with this grand experiment that was forced upon us from COVID um, so that we don't learn, uh, don't lose the learnings uh, from it. Um, We want to make sure, I mean, there were obviously a lot of challenges with remote learning, but remote learning also brings with it a lot of opportunity. um, And that could really start to push against the status quo of how we think about how education has to be delivered. Um, so I think that this is the exact right time for a paradigm shift. I mean, the the challenge is that there's going to be a lot of people who have a lot at stake in maintaining the status quo. I mean, but isn't that always the way? But and that's always the way. So. But it's it's all, and there's a lot of people who are have suffer, I mean, legitimately struggled and suffered through this entire experience that for them going back to normal, what was before is the greatest comfort that they could find. And I don't blame them at all. Um, but we can't go back to normal. I mean, normal wasn't working. No. I mean, I mean, almost 60%, actually exactly 60% of our students are not at proficiency level in reading and math by eighth grade. And that's that's not working. And so to fool ourselves into thinking that we are, it is working. Um, and, and, you know, Connecticut is rated high in the United States. I think Lamont celebrated that we were the third highest rated at, at school system in the country. That's not something to brag about, though, when, when 60% of your students are not proficient at eighth grade. And it's relative. I mean, I think the bar is low in the United States right now. Like we're kind of a race to the bottom when it comes to education. We got to look at ourselves compared to the world. And there we are getting we are getting clobbered. And so I think we have to we have to rethink things. And that scares people. But I think we're ready to um, kickstart the conversation wherever we can try to get some legislation that at least keeps a focus on it and keeps the conversation going, um, and then to do that in our in our practice as as well. We making pro- <clears throat> excuse me, we making progress. Again, I mean, it's hard to, to. There's been so much thrown at us in this last year um, that it's hard to know. I think we've maybe taken oh, maybe progress over the last ten years. Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, I think this more recent conversation in the last five years around shifting towards a better alignment of our educational system with setting students up for success. We haven't, there's a lag effect, like we haven't mm-hmm. seen the results yet. Um, we do need to think about what, what is, what are those measures of success? I know that Sal Menzo, again, on your show talked about, are we measuring even the right things? Mm-hmm. I mean, what you measure matters and that's what school districts care about. That's what they feel accountable to, but maybe we need to change some of those measures. Um, and so that's another kind of advocacy opportunity. Um, but yeah, I think we're definitely poised to to go in the right direction. That's positive. Uh, listen, two more things and we've got to go to rapid fire, but you know, you had talked about the challenges in, in urban environments. And I, one thing I want to kind of ask about is, seems like to me that there's a big connection in the challenges between our urban environments and our rural environments. Yes. You agree yep. with that? Definitely. Yep. So why don't you think the public makes that connection? I think we probably just need to do a better job of making that connection um, with with those communities. I think uh, I, I had a call yesterday. I was speaking with a group of representatives and saying that 
like we we kind of have the usual suspects who we talk to. We talk to the representatives from Hartford and New Haven and Bridgeport. And they said, you know, you got to pull in the rural representatives, um, legislators, because they get left out. And what ends up happening is it's not that we didn't think it pertained to them as well. It's just that we didn't include them in the conversation. And then when it comes time to vote, they're like, you didn't even talk to me about this. So I think we need to be really careful about like, or um, intentional about making that linkage. Um, a lot of the students are doing it. I, I think Lamont had a panel of students early on in his term um, that talked about what they wanted from education. And the rural students were the most, some of the most compelling because they were saying, we don't have access to course offerings. We don't get access to um, higher ed, dual enrollment opportunities, dual credit opportunities. We don't like, there's just a slim pickings because it, it, they, it, doesn't make sense economically to offer like the whole array of coursework for a school district that only has, you know, a few hundred kids in it. So I think we have to think about the the rural community. I think that you're spot on in making that connection. Remote learning. And remote learning is is a tool. I mean, and that's where one of the most powerful things about remote learning, I mean, we started the school year with some programs where we didn't have core instructors, certified instructors available to teach that career themed coursework and the best some of the best people to teach that coursework are actual career professionals who could come in and teach a engineering class you know in their sleep and so why aren't we creating avenues through which students could access those the best and the brightest kind of engineer or chemist or biotechnician or um, auto mechanic, like whomever it is that you want to pipe in and have them talk to the students, there should be no limitation to that because of remote learning. Yeah, listen, it all comes down to IT. Um, yeah, listen, I think that was, I think that's been uh, really great. It's been awesome uh, talking to you, uh, Shannon. And I really, uh, really appreciate it. You know, I just want to kind of maybe end on this, which is why why should and how can business leaders support what you're doing? Why should they care and why should they and how can they support it? I mean, I think they should care because it's our collective responsibility to lift up our students who are going to be our neighbors um, and and our and our coworkers and make sure that we're supporting them so that they um, can contribute meaningfully to our community and grow our state. And economy all that much more. Um, if they want to get involved, I think contacting us, we are readyct.org is our website. We're connected very much through CBIA, um, trying to, to get out the awareness of who we are and what we're doing and bring in more industry partners. So we are, we are available and happy to help channel uh, interest and energy from the business community. I said, I'm on it. Workforce is so important. It's a huge, has been a historical Connecticut advantage. We have to keep pressing uh, those advantages, triple down on it. And uh, I'm excited to have you kind of on the team driving this, like this idea, which uh, I'm really, I'm really behind. So readyct.org, uh, definitely check it out. We'll uh, definitely get you back on in the future and get some updates and hear about the successes. You ready for rapid fire? Uh, sure. <laughs> All right, here we go, Shannon. Okay. Red Sox or Yankees? Yard goods. <laughs> well played. But if I had to say Red Sox. There we go. Appreciate that. Uh, Starbucks or Duncan? Duncan. When you take time off and take COVID out of the equation, you a staycation or exotic destination gal? Um, I'm a nor Northern Woods girl. So I don't think that's exotic. No, but, but. it's like staycation-y. But it's not in my house. Yeah, right, like right. Out. Two hours away. There yeah. you go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, iPhone or Android? iPhone. Sports car or SUV? SUV. Do you have a favorite business book? Um, yeah. I mean, I'd say I probably inhabit uh, Growth Mindset by Carol Dweck, just in my own um, <laughs> existing in the world. Uh, but I love the book because I'm very much around about talent management and thinking about human capital design and Patrick Lencioni's The Ideal Team Player mm -hmm. talks about how to kind of identify a strong workforce. Yeah, Ideal Team Player is a great book. Um, if you could do anything in the entire world and you had to do something other than be the executive director at Ready CT, what would you do? So I, I, at a crossroads po point in my life, um, I almost went to work for the National Park Service. Uh -huh. And so I think I would live at a park and run operations if I could do that. Any particular park? Um, I mean, I have a fondness for Yosemite, but I love, and Rocky Mountain National Park was probably one of my favorite, but they're all 
they're all beautiful in different ways. Yeah, so if you did it, any park works. I will, well, not maybe the flatland. Ones, <laughs> and then the East Coast ones aren't nearly as, like the topography is not as exciting, but yeah. You like that uh, that diverse topography high peaks. Yeah, I'm, ma- I'm married to a geologist. Okay, there you go. I look for topography. I don't know. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, what's one thing, Shannon, that you learned early in your career, or early in your life that you think helped propel you to all the success that you've had? Um, I think... Um, just being really scrappy and resourceful. Um, I know that the, the only compliment I've ever gotten from my mother-in-law is that I'm resourceful. And I was like, I think that's a compliment. Um, and I think that's, it's. I've just never taken no for an answer. I've always tried to figure out like the next option or the next approach to trying to do something. I do it usually in a pretty quiet way, but I just kind of put my head down and keep keep at it. And usually that's served me pretty well. Gets the job done. What's one thing that you learned later in life or later in your career that if you could go back and tell young Shannon and she'd listen to you, you think have a real positive impact on her life? Um, I think I would say to, to not always be so concerned with getting things just right. I mean, I definitely, I, I've been victim of letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I've tried to let that go a lot. Um, and I think also knowing that failure is okay, as long as you respond in an appropriate way and like kind of make, make amends. Um, I, I've, I've almost kind of kept everything so tight that I know exactly where it's going to go next. And I want a little more surprise. And I think I've done that even in the last five years or especially with this role, I've started to to kind of walk that walk. Yeah. Listen, in policy, you got to be willing to let the yes. good happen. Otherwise, yes. the, yep. not a whole lot gets done. And we talked a lot today about the idea that getting something going, putting an idea into action, and then, you know, kind of reiterating from the implication sounds like uh, that's a great lesson to learn. Appreciate that. Yeah. And that's, I think that's, I've also learned a lot about, you know, if not me, then who that mm-hmm. kind of like, why would I be the one that would introduce this idea? And it's like, well, if I don't, will anybody else? <laughs> yeah. so, so I think I'm learning to, even if it's not, not a perfect idea, put it out there and see what happens. So. That's a tremendous lesson that we could all uh, take with us. Shannon, thank you so very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Ari. It was great to be here. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by IT Direct. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and spending some time with me today. You know, my goal is to help build a community where we can learn and grow together. Your input, feedback, and engagement is critical to making that happen. Please do comment, like, and subscribe so more and more people can hear what we're doing and join our community of growth and success. Thanks so much for tuning in. Talk to you again soon.